Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world in 30 Answers. Discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I'm sitting with Eileen Crane at Domaine Carneros, a beautiful, beautiful chateau in the middle of Carneros Valley. Welcome, Eileen, and uh, tell me a little bit about where we are. Well, we're in the center of the Carneros Appalachian, which is right between the city of Napa and the city of Sonoma. And Carneros is an unusual appellation because it falls both partially in Napa Valley and partially in Sonoma Valley, but it's own, its own appellation. And we're known for super high quality Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So that's our what we are and, and where we are. Um, but when we're talking about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, Chardonnay, what exactly is Domaine Carneros doing with that? Well, we make still wines or regular wines of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, of course, are not uh, usual. They're, they're the very great stylistic bent. They tend to be very elegant. But we're known actually for our sparkling wine. And we're not a very big winery, but we're in a very... Um, obvious location at the base of both Napa and Sonoma Valley. And most people who come to wine country will actually drive by Domaine Carneros. And it's the beautiful chateau on the hill on the south side of the um, Carneros Highway. And um, if you're driving by, you don't want to drive by, you want to drive in because it's as beautiful on the inside as outside may be more beautiful. And um, just on a side note, it is modeled after the home in France, correct? Yes, we're owned by Champagne Tatinger, an historic family in the uh, Champagne region. And they purchased an, um, a chateau called the Chateau de la Marca Tree in 1934. And that was the model or the inspiration for the Domaine Carnera Chateau. And so how many acres of property do you have and aside from the sparkling wine, how much wine are you making? We we farm about 350 acres. We've got a new vineyard that will be coming on um, in the next two or three years. It'll bring us to 400 acres of grapes. It's dedicated to Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. It's about equally divided between Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, a little bit more towards Pinot Noir. Um, and those are used... Those grapes are used predominantly for our sparkling wine, but we do make 20 to 25 percent of what we produce is um, Pinot Noir. We have just a tiny bit of a still Chardonnay and a little bit of a Merlot that we borrowed, <laughs> not borrowed, <laughs> bought um, from Larry Hyde, the Hyde Vineyard. So um, most of our fruit goes into our sparkling wine, um, and then the remaining 20 plus percent goes into Pinot Noir still wine. And what is your total case production? Depends upon the, the harvest, but both for still wine and sparkling wine, it ranges between about um, 55,000 cases to about 78,000 cases. So we've had a run of small vintages, but we've also most recently had larger vintages. And Domaine Carneros is a wine that we can find across the country? That's correct. So Domaine Carneros is distributed nationally. I believe it's in all states, even Alaska. <laughs> um, and uh, we're, we're distributed in Canada and the, and the Caribbean, Mexico. And we sell some of our wines back to Europe. And um, Japan is a good customer of ours. So um, you don't have to come from to the winery to enjoy it, but you certainly could. <laughs> and we have a number of wines at the winery that are not in national distribution. So if you'd like to try a little bit more of what we produce, you can go online, of course, to order. But the best way is to come and visit. Absolutely, especially for the views, because you sit out on the terrace and you look out over the valley. It's magnificent. But we won't make people too jealous about that as we <laughs> sit here. Um, so can you tell me, what is your first memory relevant to wine? Uh, my first memory of wine. When I was growing up, I grew up in the great winemaking state of New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> but my father had landed on D-Day. Um, and he, as he, the war progressed, he became enamored of the French people and the French wines. And then he went to Germany and fell in love with the German people and the German wines. So he had a wine cellar in New Jersey in the 50s. 
and he, he would let me taste wine. We only had wine on Sunday for Sunday dinner, and he had my own special little glass. Subsequently, I learned it was called a cordial glass, but it was, uh, I had a little glass and I could taste the wines. And one Sunday, he pulled out a bottle of champagne, and I thought, this is for but I had no idea how I could get into the industry as a girl, little girl in New Jersey. I mean, I didn't know any winemakers. I didn't know of any schools that taught winemaking. Um, I knew that there were wineries in upstate New York, but they were, you were probably born into a, an Italian family and you were the son of the family. So I had no hope at that point of becoming... <laughs> Um, a winemaker. I had a couple of other careers before I got into winemaking, but little by little, I found a way. I was at the Culinary Institute in Hyde Park, New York. I was taking a, a 10-week course there in 1977. Um, and they had a, a winemaker come in to, to uh, present their classes. Um, and the winemaker was from the Hudson Valley River. His name was um, Eric Miller. And he had this book called The Art of Winemaking. And I looked at the book. He let me look at it. And it was from, been published by the University of California, Davis. And I said, do they have an enology class or program? He said, I don't know. But I um, called up the University of California, Davis. And they did have a department called Fermentation Science. And I was living on the East Coast. I packed up my bags, left Connecticut at that point and um, moved to Davis, didn't know anybody out here, and just took a chance, uh, found a room in a house, took some classes. You could take classes um, informally at Davis, and that's what I did. And I met a lot of people in the um, classes, the winemaking classes, which has been enormously important to me over the years. And there was a wide range of people in that class. There were, oh, Randall Graham from Bonnie Doom, and uh, Gil Nickel from Farniente, Bruce Cakebread from Cakebread, etc. And there were there were, there were probably two or three um, dozens of winemakers today who are in the, that class and around that class um, who have become the um, the best known winemakers in this region. So you were at the beginning with all of them. Well. And pretty much, I was at the beginning with all of them. Yeah, you know, it was, I mean, it was a renaissance. Of course, um, the winemaking in California was a very big deal po pre-Pohibition. So up until the 20s, um, uh, winemaking was huge in the state of California. And there were a number of women who owned wineries and um, ran vineyards. So industry died out with Prohibition, certainly winemaking, if not great growing. And it turned out that um, there became a, um, a real renaissance when I was here. In fact, they were having trouble finding qualified winemakers to hire. And my first job was at Chandon in um, Yontville. And they hired me actually to be a tour guide, but then they found out I had a science background and they asked me to come up and work in the laboratory. And that's how I got my foot into the sparkling wine business. So, um, aside from the little cordial of champagne that your father had presented to you as a child, what would you say the first or most memorable wine was that you ever drank? The most memorable wine that I ever drank. That, it, I've drank, drank a lot of really <laughs> memorable wines. Um, a hard one to answer. I, you know, the, I tend to love the the newest one that's in my glass, but I was oh I was always drawn to sparkling wines and champagnes. I um, really uh, sought them out when I had enough money, of course, because in the early days uh, they're expensive wines. And uh, I've noticed that over the years. I mean, when I was first at Davis, I was interested in Cabernet. And that's what everybody was interested in. That when there was Infidel was popular. But today, I'm really drawn not only to sparkling wines, but I drink quite a, a bit of Sauvignon Blanc. I like a lot of the really fresh, lively uh, rosés that are now available. We make a wonderful one. It's at the winery just for about a month. It sells out so fast. Um, and I drink a lot of Pinot Noir. So I don't tend to like really heavy wines. I t tend to enjoy really elegantly styled wines. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's tough when you drink so many good wine that you can't pick one (laughs) out of all of them. (laughs) So traveling the world abroad, what would you say the best foreign wine is that you've ever drunk? Well, I'm partial to the Tatinger's wines, and it is a style. We don't copy each other, um, obviously, because we're of different appellations. Claude Tatinger, when he hired me, said, you are of Corneros, we are of Champagne. If you were trying to imitate a Champagne, it wouldn't be nearly as good as what you could do understanding Corneros. Um, And he used the analogy that where would Picasso have been if he were trying to imitate Renoir? He never would have been great on his own. So um, I've always enjoyed the Tatinger wines. I I appreciate those in particular. Um, I drink a wide range of champagnes and sparkling wines on Friday night, which is tonight. (laughs) Um, I I always sit down and and enjoy a, a bottle with either friends or my partner. And among all the populations of the world, who do you think drinks the best in terms of quality? I think probably the Americans do. Um, The Europeans, I find, um, drink wine, and it's it's something that's on the table along with with water, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, And it seems like younger um, Europeans often um, are drinking sodas um, as a kind of break from their parents. Um, So I don't think that the Europeans in general really seek um, high quality wine. I think that what they produce is often for an export market. Now, of course, there are exceptions always. And I think the Brits probably look more towards quality than anybody else in Europe would be my guess. Um, I think the the Japanese have a a fine palate um, and enjoy fine wines. Um, But I, I think solidly the U.S., perhaps because we're new in the industry and we're trying to figure out what this is all about, that we we look for advice in winemaking, we look for advice in, in like what we should buy, and we're, we're, we're tempted to try the next um, great thing that's, that's suggested. So I'm going to make a great assumption that you have a wine cellar at home, and I'm curious what your most expensive bottle is in there. <laughs> We have a, a very old Lafitte. I, I think it was a, um, a 1970. I don't know if it's the most valuable. <laughs> it's, some of the, it's certainly a bottle that's looking for a special occasion. We have a couple of those around. Um, I have uh, some of the Tainter Comte de Champagne in, in Magnums, which is uh, our wonderful way to enjoy a, uh, an event to open them up for mm-hmm. friends. Um, so I think... I, I, w- w- in fact, we've got so many old, great California um, Cabernets and so many great older Bordeaux that we're, we're aggressively trying to um, uh, drink them <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety? Perfect variety. Well, I would say it's the one in your glass if you like it, but <laughs> the perfect variety. Varieties are interesting because there are so many... Um, facets to them. You know, you, you think Pinot Noir, but there are dozens of different types of Pinot Noir and they're very different in how they express themselves. So the perfect variety, I wouldn't say there is. I think for sparkling wine, I feel strongly that Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are perfect. We've, we've experimented with um, Pinot Blanc over the years and we find that's a nice nice accent um, but we don't it's never been a major part of anything we do um, and we use it we're using a little bit of Pinot Gris yeah, it's always so heavily predominant Chardonnay and Pinot Noir the first sparkling wine I think it it really is I've never had a great sparkling wine that wasn't made um, from Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and that's including I don't, Pinot Meunier is usually used heavily in Champagne and it's not a grape that I like and I generally don't like wine me from that. So um, this is always a tough question, but what's your thoughts on wine critics and scores? Wine critics have a palate, like we all have a palate. So the wine critics will um, judge things based on their palate. So, and what else could you do? I mean, if they were trying to judge something based on somebody else's palate, it wouldn't be authentic. So they have a particular palate. So it's really important either if you're going to be following wine um, writers or wine judges, wine scorers, you have to find someone who has a palate that's similar to yours. And if a wine writer likes heavier, great big wines, 
th th that just may not appeal to you. So you have to find someone who writes or, or scores that, that has a, you, you've tasted their, the wines that they recommend and you like them. So that it's important to find that that one or two or half a dozen people who give advice on wine. It doesn't match what you really want to drink. So I know you were talking a little bit about what you like to drink, but if you had to choose red, white, or rosé? Well, what time of the year? <laughs> what's, what's the situation? So, it, you know, I had a dinner party on um, uh, Tuesday night with some good friends, and we were going through some older Cabernets. So that night, red, red was exactly <laughs> the right thing. Um, all summer long, um, I drink rosé, whether it's my sparkling rosé, somebody else's sparkling, or still rosé. I really like rosés in uh, warmer weather, although I... I don't exclude other forms of sparkling wine or, um, uh, or um, Sauvignon Blancs, for instance, in the summer. I, so it's really, um, and in the winter, I look more towards um, the greater wine. So like uh, we make a wonderful Blanc de Blanc called La Rev. And it's not a heavy wine, but it's, it's a more serious wine. And so um, I would, I, I'd be more likely to serve that inside um, with a more serious dinner, like maybe with scallops or something like that. So, um, I, what is what would I like as my what's my favorite wine? What would I say? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's a seasonal question. So, I know this is probably a tough question to ask a sparkling wine producer, but uh, still, or sparkling wine. Oh, that's an easy question, isn't it? I wouldn't be making sparkling wine if it wasn't my first love. Yes. And um, I'm going to guess uh, domestic or champagne or another region. Well, um, I, I don't really say by region because there's so many great wines. Uh, I think it's important that you don't, you're not going to find a great wine unless it's made method traditional or miss method champenoise and find sparkling wine. You, you need to look for that. But I've, I've tasted really great sparkling wines or champagnes um, around the world. And um, it's really the palate. And I tend to have a palate that's um, understated elegance. And I always think of my wines as being Audrey Hepburn in the little black dress. Everything's in its place. Um, you look at Audrey Hepburn and you know that there's just enough. It's complete and it's elegant and she's kicky and she's fun. Um, I don't lot want, I'm definitely in wine style. I'm not a Dolly Parton. <laughs> so I tend to go for the um, more elegantly style. I don't want things that are um, have that are heavily tannic, um, sometimes Pinot Noirs, not ours, but Pinot Noirs are sometimes made with the addition of um, Syrah. Those do not appeal to me at all. Um, and heavy Cabernets or, uh, you know, they, they can be big ones, but not heavy. Right. Yeah. And um, I know that there's always the discussion of white wine and fish, red wine with meat. Um, obviously, sparkling wine has a far broader um, palette. So how do you play with food and wine pairing? Well, it's an interesting question. We're just thinking we've got this beautiful new addition to the winery. We maybe even improve the Chateau with this gorgeous new um, glass conservatory. The French would call that a Jardin de Hiver or a winter garden. Um, and it's a beautiful area. And one of the things that we've done to introduce um, that conservatory is we've done a food and wine pairing with sparkling round wine, sparkling wines, and the pairing is with all Asian inspired dishes, and it shows the um, versatility of using sparkling wine. It's just I fell in love the first time um, over filet mignon and a, a bottle of champagne. So um, I, I think it's a very very flexible wine, um, and. It, it really, there's nothing. We're thinking about doing another food and wine pairing. Why not do Moroccan? Why not do um, the cuisine of Champagne? Why not do um, something else that's you don't normally think of at Champagne cuisine? You do think of Champagnes, but the other great, interesting cuisines of the world um, that sparkling wine, it's Christmas really plays off. Um, almost all cuisines. And the, for instance, a heavy meat dish, if you have a heavy wine to go with it, it's almost like too much heaviness, whereas um, sparkling wine refreshes your palate. So it's, you really can't go wrong. Yeah. So for anyone who's concerned about the rules, when in doubt, just get a sparkling wine. 
Absolutely. And don't be made to believe that you had to have a certain wine. If you like red wine and fit with fish, drink red wine with fish. I think um, someone once told me that the vast majority of wines in Italy um, were red and that people drank them with fish, that wine, white wine was not historically that available in the world of wines, that white wines, until refrigeration came about, red, white wines were not particularly as good as red wines because the tannins were protective of the wine. And it was, but the white wines would oxidize quickly and they, they would lose their freshness. And it wasn't until um, refrigerated tanks um, came about that um, we started to see um, the interest and, and the, the boom in white wines. So what do you think that somebody misses out on by not tasting your wine? Well, I think someone who, who doesn't taste wines widely it takes a chance of missing out. So, and I think Americans kind of think that sparkling wine is just for your 25th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Maybe your wedding with a, a wedding cake, which is the wrong place to be serving um, a champagne in a wedding or sparkling wine at a wedding it should be right after the ceremony, the, the celebratory moment and coffee with the cake. Even if we're sensible, um, being careful about your guests not running into danger leaving. So um, what was the question again? <laughs> what does someone miss out on if they're not tasting your wine? Well, I think that, you know, that what they would miss out if it was to their palate is the freshness, the liveliness, and the deliciousness of it. That um, many people who come here who, you know, see the Chateau and they don't really even know that we're a sparkling wine producer. And I'll see them outside on the terrace because my office looks out and um, you'll see people tasting the sparkling wine for the first time. It's like, because huh? people have had so much bad sparkling wine that they think it's, you know, they, they've had those um, things where it had to be sparkling wine, but they weren't going to um, pay for something that was good. And like with any product, um, the best stuff does cost a little bit more. So I, it's, I, there's a table right outside my window, and I'll see that there'll be a couple sitting there, and one will have the, the red um, taste, and one will have the sparkling. And I'll see the glass of the sparkling go over the table, and then someone will just take their hand and say, no, no, no. And then the, the, the second or third time, and then all of a sudden you'll see this look on their face like, oh, now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so you might be missing, missing the absolute best of wine if you don't taste sparkling. Good, really good sparkling wine. Your sparkling wine. Yes. <laughs> so if space aliens were to land on your property, what wine would you want to give them? T space aliens? Space aliens. Space aliens. Well, you'd have to start with sparkling wine, right? But which one? Which one? Oh, it would be really a hard thing to do. It would be an extraordinary happening, wouldn't it? So I think the, uh, um, probably the Larev. So each vintage tells a different story. I'm sure you would agree with that. And in your experience, do you find that more things repeat themselves or are the opposite from year to year? You mean from harvest to harvest are the wines more similar? Well, where we are is the Carneros, the southern part of Napa and Sonoma. And we sit on top of the San Francisco or San Pablo Bay. So this is a very consistent climate. Um, it's a marine climate. Um, and marine climate. You think of Hawaii, if someone says, do you want to go? You don't say, is it winter or summer? You say, where's the plane, right? So we're a marine climate. We have um, we have winter and summer here, but it's a much more um, even uh, year. So we don't see vast changes year to year in the Carneros. But at the same time, one as a winemaker, um, I've got more history in this area. I've got I've been here at the winery for 32 years now, um, and before that, I spent 10 years making wines, uh, sparkling wines, other places. So, over those years, my skills have increased, my preferences have changed slightly, not dramatically. But you think of a great artist. A great artist, over time, what they paint changes over time. So again, you know, started out with one way and then went to the rose period and the blue period and then the cubist period, et cetera, et cetera. And, and chefs, they may start out in one area that they were particularly interested in and then they shifted to another area that they might have started out French and then it moved towards maybe a, J a Japanese cuisine. They find a different way over time that it, it makes more sense to them. 
So if you have less variation from vintage to vintage, do you have any um, signs or omens that will predict when harvest is going to start and what it's going to be like? And we do have, I wouldn't say omens, but we do have, because it's consistent, we know within, in pretty much within a three week period of time when our harvest will start. Um, and we know usually by um, middle of May when the harvest is going to, a good guess within probably seven or eight days of when harvest is going to start. So, and do we know if it's going to be a good harvest or a bad harvest? I, I've, I've worked in uh, in Carneros for with Carneros fruit for the last forty plus years, and I've only seen one r- really difficult harvest, and that was 1982. So you, you, it's really very dependable down here as far as quality, and because we pick earlier than still wines, we don't we don't run into rain. And do you have any rituals for good luck that you do um, each year as harvest is going to start? Oh, we have a wonderful opening party. Um, <laughs> they insist upon calling it the blessing of the grapes. But I, think, well, I guess we do in a way. We um, the, when the first grapes go into our presses, we um, pop a bottle of um, one of our sparkling wines and we sort of christen it as it uh, goes into the um, presses with an, a bottle that's already gone through the entire process. So um, that is the. Um, that is the, the the ceremony, and we didn't do that ceremony. People would be very disappointed. <laughs> we don't announce it in advance because we don't usually really know exactly which day it's going to be. But the people who happen to show up then, um, as visitors, will get quite a, a thrill out of that. Yes. Many um, winemakers have been known to talk to their wines, whether it's in the vineyard or in the cellar. Have you been known to talk to your wines at what point, and what do you say to them? Well, I talk to my friends while they're drinking my wine, but I haven't really talked to my wines. I have to think about that. When you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a sparkling winemaker. I knew by the time I was eight or nine that that's what I wanted. Well, that was my experience. If I had known then that I could actually do that, I would have... um, moved out to California when I was 18 and and applied at Davis, but I I had no idea how to get into the wine industry. I had a few other, I actually taught nutrition for the University of Connecticut. My um, graduate work was in nutrition and biochemistry. I did social work in Venezuela, so I've had a very varied background before I got to the wine industry. I hope nobody's adding up these years, but... (laughs) But deep down, you always knew you wanted to be a sparkling wine producer. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) A kid from New Jersey. Who knew? (laughs) I I think I was born a (laughs) bubblehead. So when you're not working, how do you spend your free time? Ah, well, um, having uh, dinner parties with friends. I love to read books. Um, I love to travel the world. I love doing little adventures. I, uh, I've got a planned trip down to San Francisco to um, see what's new in the world of uh, museums and food and other things at the end of next week. Um, take little day trips up to like Sea Ranch, which is close fairly close to to here, about two hours away. Um, Recently, I went to the Crocker Museum in Sacramento. So doing those little adventures, and you you, you don't have to always get on a plane to really see something spectacular. Do you have a favorite film dedicated to wine? Dedicated to wine. Or about wine. About wine. No, I... I, Yeah, that's a hard question for me. That's the only (laughs) one I've sort of reneged on. (laughs) Fair enough. For a really romantic evening, what wine would you order? Well, of course it would be bubbles, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, we make a little bit of a Le Rosé, so for a really romantic evening, that's what I would have. I would pull out the Le Rosé, yeah. Um, What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? I've received so much good advice. (laughs) (laughs) A nice way to skirt the answer. I'm trying to think, what was the best advice that I ever received? Uh, Probably from Ann Noble. So Ann Noble was a professor at UC Davis. She just retired recently. Um, But when I came out to Davis and had moved, and I, um, uh, the first professor I talked to tried to discourage me from going into, it was a male man, um, and he tried to to discourage me from going into the wine industry. He said, you know, you'll have to do another um, graduate degree. Um, and nobody will hire you because you can't do the barrel work. 
And he says, so I don't think you're going to ever manage to be a winemaker. And I said, well, I am going to be a winemaker. And he said, well, I don't think so, but we've got this new woman professor. Uh, maybe uh, she'd be willing to talk to you. I think what he was saying, maybe she can talk some sense into you. Um, but he um, called up and uh, Ann Noble was willing to talk to me. She had just arrived like two days previously. She had nothing but boxes in her office. And she said, oh, you don't need another degree. You've got a science background. Come and take some classes and convince somebody you can do it. And that's exactly what I did. I was at Davis for all of four months. And it was the right time, too, because everything was opening up. They were looking for people. But um, that was the best advice. What piece of advice would you like to give our listeners today? Don't be shy about opening a bo- bottle of sparkling wine when it's not an occasion. And if you open the bottle of a good sparkling wine, the occasion will come. I have found that people say, well, I can't open it on a thir- Thursday night. Yes, you can. It's only one more day of work if, you do, <laughs> if, you're, if you're anxious to be free of it. Or, you know, if it's lunch on Monday, you know. There's a celebration there that, yes. So whatever it is, once you open the bottle, and think about it, when friends come to your house or guests come to your house, they hear the, the cork come out of, of a bottle of Chardonnay, and they think that's nice. They see, hear the cork pop on a sparkling wine, they think, whoa, they're really happy to see me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what um, would you say is your proudest achievement in your work to date? I, I, can I have two? You may. Okay. So um, we, when we made the Larev, um, the very first re- time I tasted it, not in the laboratory. Of course, I tasted it repeatedly in the laboratory. But we had an event here um, in September of uh, 1998. And we had a number of press people here. And I was, of course, trying to get everybody seated, make sure everybody was happy, answering questions. And I sat down and I picked up the glass of sparkling wine to my right and didn't think anything of it. I took a sip and I thought, what is that? <laughs> and it was the epiphany moment because I had forgot. I wasn't thinking that it was going to be the Lorette, but it was the first time I picked up the Lorette in a social setting. And I thought, oh, that is it. So that was the, the great uh, epiphany in sparkling wine. Fantastic. And you said you had a second proud achievement. Well, a proud achievement, We about 12 years ago, um, we started to started to do open book management. And um, about seven or eight years ago, we adopted a system, system called Zingerman's out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And it has just completely changed how we work as a company. I think people are, they, they say, we, st- we came here for a job because everybody we talked to was happy. And it just changed. I think people were happy here before, but not to the same extent that um, people's opinions count. We listen to people. We ask people to actually participate. So we show people information about the company. So it makes sense to people. And um, and it's a friendly company. We, 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 and we educate our staff on what the story is about Domain Carneros and what the thing, what and provide education in many other ways here. So um, it's a good place to work and I'm, I'm really proud of that. You should be because when you come here and I've been a guest here numerous times, everyone's always smiling. Everybody knows what they're talking about. Um, you don't get misinformation as you can in other places. It's really a beautiful experience, not just because of the view and the wines. <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to complete this sentence. A table without wine is like... A bad breakfast. (laughs) (laughs) So I know a lot of famous people have drunk your wine um, across all boards of of life um, and fame. But if there was one famous person um, from any walk of life filmed, uh, photographed by paparazzi, and in that photo was a bottle of your wine sitting on the table, who would you want that person to be? Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> <laughs> that was the easiest yeah. answer ever. <laughs> that, was, that was obvious to me. <laughs> so tell me, do you think um, we'll be drinking wine in 200 years' time, 500 years' time, and what do you think we'll be drinking? Well, I think we'll be drinking very fine wines because we keep learning how to produce better and better wines. And why would you give up wine? 
there's so many good things about wine. So I can't imagine. You know, the the tech industry moves really quickly, but great food and great wine. Why why would you give that up? Unless they, you know, you certainly don't want to think I don't have to eat anymore. I'll have a feeding tube. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, I'm sending you off to a deserted island, and you get to take three wines with you. What three wines would they be? He said, and I thought you were going to say a deserted island. I thought, well, that's my kind of place. <laughs> a desert island. Okay, what, what would the wines be? Desert island or deserted island. Either way, you only have three wines you can take with you. <laughs> uh, well, that's easy. I'd bring a, a, a great b- bottle of, probably bring a bottle of the Rev. Probably bring, a, a, and our rosé sparkling is wonderful. And of course, center, on a desert island. That would be a very particularly good thing. And um, there might be the occasion where you still wanted to have a, a glass of Pinot Noir so, on a desert island. Yeah. <laughs> is there going to be a corkscrew? The, the good thing about sparkling wine is you don't have to have a corkscrew on a desert island. That's so true. if you're planning ahead. <laughs> well, in fairness, it's your island, so it could be whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So of all the wine regions in the world, what is one winemaking area you would still like to explore? Oh, there's so many I would still like to explore. I mean, my goodness. I've been to Champagne many, many times. I'd be happy to go back there and spend a you know, month just go, driving around the, ba- the back um, streets and, and roads. Um, I've just been up in Willamette last week. I did a presentation, and I love going up there. Beautiful area, so I, that would be an interesting area to explore. And I've been in Australia and New Zealand and had opportunities to... So limiting yourself, mm, that's not my way. <laughs> but is there one place that's on the top of your list that you want to get back to or get to for the first time? Mm, where would that be? <laughs> so many choices. <laughs> well, there's... there's um, I've never been to China or to see, but there's apparently um, a booming wine industry there. So that might be an interesting thing to do. Okay. Well, we're almost finished. Mm -hmm. So the last thing we do is we play a little game. It's wine soundtrack. So wine, sound, music. Um, Just curious because so many times wine conjures up... um, Sounds. We either listen to music while we're drinking wine or we think of songs when we're having wine. So I'm just going to throw out a couple wines that we've talked about. And I want you to tell me either what it makes you think of or what you would listen to while you're doing it. So let's just start with Le Rev, the simplest one. Ah, Le Rev. You know, I think that that would go well with um, a classical music piece. I think that that's probably a good choice for that. And what about um, a Carneros Pinot Noir? That could be good with jazz. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, that would be a very good choice with um, Pinot Noir. In fact, like, last night we had a Pinot Noir and we did have jazz while we were having dinner, <laughs> sort of mellow jazz, but yes. So we were just up in the Willamette Valley. What about an Oregon Pinot Noir? Let's see. What did, what have I had? I well, the Resonance Winery is just getting started, and I had an opportunity to taste three of their their, their three wines, and that was very interesting. Yeah. And what kind of music what would I have with that? I guess I do see Pinot Noir and jazz. I do see that. Yeah. Across the board. Okay. okay. And what about a Napa Cab? Maybe an Eric Satie piece. Okay. <laughs> and the last one, as you seem to be drinking a lot of it, Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> Judy Collins. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Eileen, I want to thank you for joining us today. And before we go, if you could just remind people where they can find you, both online and in person. It's domaincarneros.com. And in person, we are just off the Carneros Highway. It also has um, highway name 12112. And it's right in the middle between Napa, the city of Napa and the city of Sonoma, probably a little closer to Napa. We're on the south side. It's the chateau on the hill. Yes, it's very hard to miss it. (laughs) You really have to be looking at your phone when you're driving if you miss this one. (laughs) And um, do you need an appointment to come here or can you just walk in? Well, sometimes you can get in without a reservation, but certainly on weekends, um, what reservations are mandatory. During the week, depends, depends, uh, but it's always a good idea um, to um, have a reservation in advance. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us here at Wine Soundtrack and cheers. Cheers. 
Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.